So since we went offensive line on the Notre Dame side, let's go back there because in your scouting of Texas A&M, and Mike Elko has something to do with this, even though he just arrived as the head coach, of course, his defensive coordinator did a great job forming one of the great front sevens in college football, even though they were losing roughly four games a year under Jimbo Fisher. It typically wasn't because of the front seven on defense. Uh, they were really stout there and were again last year. Is that your number one cause of concern? Because before you school me here, that would be mine if I'm Notre Dame would be offensive line versus blocking their front. So sometimes, Mark, you know, when you're schooling somebody, you got to correct them and show them the error of their ways, right? Sometimes it's well done. Well done, sir. That's the biggest one right there. I mean, it, it, that was my biggest concern before Charles Jagasaw got hurt. It'd be my biggest concern if Joe Walton, Blake Fisher both came back. I mean, that that is the strength of this football team. And they returned talent that was already there. They did lose some players to the portal. Walter Nolan left. Anthony Lucas left two years ago. Fidel Diggs left for Syracuse. But then they replaced those guys with Nick Scourton, who's better than anybody that left. There's still plenty of talented players coming back. There's some kids that have transferred in. They, you know, I think it's important nowadays on the D line, especially now in this era of, you know, you've got to win 15, 16 games. And if you play in your conference title game and lose, you've got to play 17 games to win a championship. Depth is of the utmost importance. One of the things I love about the Notre Dame D line, Mark, is they can throw waves at you. I mean, they're not just the starters. And after that, there's a big drop off. They can throw waves of playmakers and, and A&M is very similar. Yes, their starting lineup is very good, but they've got guys that can move around. Shamar Turner can play inside. He can play outside. You've got Nick Scourton, who's a dynamic player off the edge. You've got guys coming off the bench. I mean, Rodas Johnson transfers in from Wisconsin. He's a solid football for Wisconsin. He's second, third string for them now. Again, they're just going to be able to throw a lot of people at you. And that's that's really the key to having a talented defensive line is, okay, defensive linemen can't play 95% of the snaps like a cornerback can. They have to have some sort of rotation. And when there's a big drop-off between one and two, that's how you can get beat. And that's not the case for this Texas A&M line And it's not the case for the Notre Dame defensive line. That's absolutely my biggest concern. It's a young, it's a talented, but very young inexperienced and not massive Notre Dame offensive line. It's also a very athletic offensive line going against a very physical, big, experienced defensive line that I think three of the expected starters are returners. So they're not exactly like Florida state was dealing with, with some of their position groups yesterday. Like you're looking at other teams, like A&M is doing it at some other spots. Like A&M has got a completely revamped roster on the second and third levels whole bunch of new DBs coming over from Kansas State and Incarnate Word and all these other, you know, Central Michigan, all these places. But their D-line outside of Scourton and the starting lineup are guys that have been there. And so I think that's something that benefits them. And how well Notre Dame holds up against that group is ultimately, I believe, going to be the thing that determines if Notre Dame can or can't win this football game or win this particular matchup in this football game. So, Brian, getting to my next point, it leads me to like a nine to six ball game because looking at the Texas A&M offensive line during the Kevin Sumlin years, they were churning out, especially at left tackle, excellent offensive lines. And again, first rounders at left tackle into the Jimbo Fisher era. So that's something that surprised me about how bad they were along the offensive front last year. And they only brought back one starter. And he wasn't uh, a great player, but a stable guy. Uh, so when you look at Notre Dame and what they bring defensively versus Texas A&M and the struggles that they had last year and are going to try to show that they fixed, uh, are you, uh, is this Notre Dame defensive line pretty much smelling blood? Well, I would hope so. I mean, that's been sort of my frustration this offseason, Mark, has, has been this notion that all everybody wants to talk about is the matchup between the Notre Dame offensive line and the Texas A&M defensive line. And, and for good reason. I don't have a problem with people wanting to talk about that matchup. But then there's just a complete ignoring the fact that, hey, there's this pretty important matchup on the other side of the ball, too, uh, that has a Notre Dame defensive line that was one of the nation's best last year. And, and this isn't even just my opinion. You can go look at analysts and people that cover the sport that aren't, if you perceive me to have a Notre Dame bias, that say, hey, look, it's Michigan's combination of Mason Graham and Kenneth Grant and Notre Dame's combination of Riley Mills and Howard Cross that are the two best 
you know, defensive tackle tandems coming back in college football. And then you land RJ Oban, who was a very productive pass rusher at Duke for the last few years, got coached by Mike Elko and prepared by Mike Elko. Jordan Patelho returns. And then, of course, Marcus Freeman recruiting is, is what's going to fill out the depth chart. And that's one of the things I've talked about with this group is, you know, we're going to find out this year just how good of a coach or recruiter that that Marcus Freeman is because so much of the depth chart is being filled by guys that were Marcus Freeman recruits. And so if if they're as good as we think they are and, and hope that they are, if you're a Notre Dame fan, then that's going to add to it as well when you look at at, at guys like, you know, Bubakar Traore and Josh Burnham and, and uh, Bryce Young and, and players like that. So, you know, how they handle themselves is going to go a long way towards this matchup. And as you mentioned, Texas A&M was not a great – offensive line last season they do have two new starters they got a kid from from uh kansas armage reed adams who was a, a good big player and a good player at kansas last year they got kalinu uh i don't know how to pronounce his last name from utah uh, at center six three three thirty adds a lot of size to the mix chase basantis was a freshman all-american last year he's back and then the question is going to be what happens at tackle because Ruben Feathery, Fathery has been was their starter there last year and he's injured so he's probably not going to play much or at least won't start. We've got Demetrius Crown over starting there now and then of course Trey Zoom's coming back at left tackle so they should be better than they were last year. The question is how quickly can they gel, right? Like everything I just talked about with Notre Dame about you've got these new guys and they've got to come together and play together. Well. You're looking at Texas A&M. They've got two transfers are starting on the offensive line. You got a new guy at right tackle, and how are they going to be able to come together? How will they gel together and and play against what is a really good defensive line? And and so that's why I say it's that's the matchup on both sides of the ball is whose offensive line can hold up the best against the other team's defensive line, and that's going to be a big key. To, and then on top of that, you know, how do you handle it? There's these are two really smart defensive coaches, Mike Elko, obviously for the Duke team. You've got Al Golden for the for Notre Dame. How do they handle the pressure packages? How do they handle the where they're bringing backers from? And and Elko likes to bring corner fires and nickel fires and safety fires and things along those lines. Does Notre Dame's linemen and quarterback handle that stuff really well? And and what? How does having Riley Leonard give you an advantage? I I, I was asked this a couple of weeks ago, Mark. Uh, you know, does does are you worried about the advantage that Mike Elko has of playing? He he knows Riley Leonard, and I said I actually think in a lot of cases it's the player that has more of the advantage than the coach. And Mike Elko nailed that answer today. He said, "Look, yeah, we know what he did in our system, but like we're not familiar with what he's going to do in that system. He knows who we are. He knows what we do." And and I thought that was a very interesting answer as well because how how can Riley Leonard help you recognizing some of those things that he's seen a thousand times like okay that safety starts doing this it usually means this will that be an advantage at all will they try to use that to their advantage by trying to maybe bait Riley Leonard into some mistakes thinking showing things that they know are tendencies that part of the matchup is going to be fascinating but at the end of the day Mark it's what happens in the trenches on both sides of the ball is going to be and to me, the biggest determiner of who wins this game outside of the things like turnovers and, and, you know, things along those lines. College football is even more exciting with some action on the line and the games are even better when you're cashing in and the voice of college football is the place to be to get the greatest value. Let's start with my picks 75% against the money line, 58% against the spread. I've got a 40 year track record. In fact, in 2023, at $100 played per game, you would have netted over $9,300. And guess what? I'm just the warm-up act. Steve Merrill, our ace in the hole, show stopper from Wager Talk, six years with the voice of college football, over 30 years in the industry. Steve gives us analysis on all the big games, but you can't miss Steve's weekly under-the-radar pick, which went 21 and 5 against the spread the last two seasons. I repeat, 21 and 5 against the spread. You also get picks from some of our top analysts here at the Voice of College Football, including Steve Dace and Matt Zemick. Become a YouTube channel member or Patreon member for just $99 per month. Go to the main channel on YouTube, click join, and select the betting tier. Do the same thing on Patreon. Make 2024 a winner now. 